the member countries. Since the 1950s, WMO has pulled together its members from 191 states and territories to address the common challenges brought on by natural hazards. No one country in meteorology can do this alone. It was recognized more than a century ago, and since then, the World Meteorological Organization provides essential leadership in cooperation globally. So every country would have contribution and also access to the global information and global services. We are operating the global public good system where many, many nations take responsibility to help others in exchanging prediction and sharing knowledge. The critical importance of WMO is that to serve as a framework of collaboration which allow members under the same standard and the same format which enable people to understand each other. The key factor WMO members contributed to the disastrous reduction is the improvement of weather forecasting accuracy. Now we can reach the same accuracy at seven days with a 90% of confidence in the weather pattern. They say that's the science, the real advancement. All the governments, all the partners can rely on this information to take actions. In 2013, when Typhoon Haiyan struck Philippines, requested by the government of Vietnam, WMO organized an emergency response team comprises of the weather surface of China, Hong Kong, China, and also the regional center in Japan. And the evacuation of some 600,000 people was very effective in mitigating the hazard arising from Typhoon Haiyan. WMO provides regional and global support to all its members, each at different stages of socio-economic development. So in more developed countries, uh, systems are in place, uh, early alerts are in place, there's good response systems, but in many developing countries and small island states, uh, these systems are not in place, so um, the poverty and the lack of governance structures actually exacerbates the impact of disasters quite disproportionately. It's an encouraging fact that if we look at trends currently, less people die from disasters than they did 10 years ago. However, that trend is not homogeneous across all countries. And there are a number of countries, and particularly low-income countries and small island developing states, where that trend is reversed. That means that the number of people losing their lives to disasters is actually trending up. And that is very much the rationale behind this new initiative that WMO and a number of partners have launched called CRUISE, we're trying to help bridge the gap between some of the more advanced countries and those countries which don't have those systems in place. Zhongguo内地，我们承担了呃二十二个，就世界气象组的中心，通过这些中心呢来帮助其他发展中国家来加强能力的能力方面建设。我们中国政府每年提供奖学金，就请他们来参加留学。One can look up to see a piece of the blue sky. But together, we can see the skies of the Earth. WMO, we are really grateful and honored to be winners of the UIC Blue Prize 2018. And we are planning to use the, the, the resources uh, uh, to enhance the global disaster risk reduction capacity and especially support uh, uh, our developing country members in, in, in improving their, their service capability. Over the past two decades, changing climate has intensified natural disasters all over the world because hazards in one place are cautiously linked to weather conditions in the others. We at the United Nations Specialized Agency for, for Weather, Climate and Water, and, and we are dealing with the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services, which are responsibility for, for early warnings of, uh, of, of short-term weather events, or so climate issues and water resource management in the member countries. Since the 1950s, 
WMO has pulled together its members from 191 states and territories to address the common challenges brought on by natural hazards. No one country in meteorology can do this alone. It was recognized more than a century ago, and since then, the World Meteorological Organization provides essential leadership in cooperation globally. So every country would have contribution and also access to the global information and global services. We are operating the global public good system where many, many nations take responsibility to help others in exchanging prediction and sharing knowledge. The critical importance of WMO is that to serve as a framework of collaboration which allow members under the same standard and the same format which enable people can understand each other. The key factor WMO members contribute to the disastrous reduction is the improvement of weather forecasting accuracy. Now we can reach the same accuracy at seven days with a 90% of confidence and in the weather pattern. They say that's the science. The real advancement, all the governments, all the partners can rely on this information to take actions. In 2013, when Typhoon Haiyan struck Philippines, requested by the government of Vietnam, WMO organized an emergency response team comprises of the weather surface of China, Hong Kong, China, and also the regional center in Japan and the evacuation of some 600,000 people was very effective in mitigating the hazard arising from Typhoon Haiyan. WMO provides regional and global support to all its members, each at different stages of socio-economic development. So in more developed countries, uh, systems are in place, uh, early alerts are in place, there's good response systems, but in many developing countries and small island states, uh, these systems are not in place, so um, the poverty and the lack of governance structures actually exacerbates the impact of disasters quite disproportionately. It's an encouraging fact that if we look at trends currently, less people die from disasters than they did 10 years ago. However, that trend is not homogeneous across all countries, and there are a number of countries, in particular low-income countries, and small island developing states where that trend is reversed. That means that the number of people losing their lives to disasters is actually trending up. And that is very much the rationale behind this new initiative that WMO and a number of partners have launched called CRUZ, where we're trying to help bridge the gap between some of the more advanced countries and those countries which don't have those systems in place. One can look up to see a piece of the blue sky. But together, we can see the skies of the Earth. WMO, we are really grateful and honored uh, to be uh, winners of the UIC Wu Prize uh, 2018. And we are planning to use the, the, the resources uh, uh, to enhance the global disaster risk reduction capacity, and especially support uh, uh, our developing country members in, in, in improving their, their service capability. Over the past two decades, changing climate has intensified natural disasters all over the world because hazards in one place are cautiously linked to weather conditions in the others. We at the United Nations Specialized Agency for, for Weather, Climate and Water, and, and we are dealing with the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services, which are responsibility for, for early warnings of, uh, of, of short-term weather events, of climate issues and water resource management in the member countries. 
Since the 1950s, WMO has pulled together its members from 191 states and territories to address the common challenges brought on by natural hazards. No one country in meteorology can do this alone. It was recognized more than a century ago, and since then, the World Meteorological Organization provides essential leadership in cooperation globally. So every country would have contribution and also access to the global information and global services. We are operating the global public good system where many, many nations take responsibility to help others in exchanging prediction and sharing knowledge. The critical importance of WMO is that to serve as a framework of collaboration which allow members under the same standard and the same format which enable people to understand each other. The key factor WMO members contribute to the disaster reduction is the improvement of weather forecasting accuracy. Now we can reach the same accuracy at seven days with a 90% of confidence in the weather pattern. They say that's the science. The real advancement, all the governments, all the partners can rely on this information to take actions. In 2013, when Typhoon Haiyan struck the Philippines, requested by the government of Vietnam, WMO organized an emergency response team comprises of the weather surface of China, Hong Kong, China, and also the regional center in Japan. And the evacuation of some 600,000 people was very effective in mitigating the hazard arising from Typhoon Haiyan. WMO provides regional and global support to all its members, each at different stages of socio-economic development. So in more developed countries, uh, systems are in place, uh, early alerts are in place, there's good response systems, but in many developing countries and small island states, uh, these systems are not in place. So um, the poverty and the lack of governance structures actually exacerbates the impact of disasters quite disproportionately. It's an encouraging fact that if we look at trends currently, less people die from disasters than they did 10 years ago. However, that trend is not homogeneous across all countries. And there are a number of countries, in particularly low-income countries and small island developing states, where that trend is reversed. That means that the number of people losing their lives to disasters is actually trending up. And that is very much the rationale behind this new initiative that WMO and a number of partners have launched called CRUISE, where we're trying to help bridge the gap between some of the more advanced countries and those countries which don't have those systems in place. Zhongguo内地,我们承担了阿沙尔格,就世界青年组的中心,通过这些中心来帮助其他发展中国家来加强能力的能力方面的建设。我们通过政府每年提供奖学金,就请他们来参加留学。我们还承担了世界青年组这
WMO has pulled together its members from 191 states and territories to address the common challenges brought on by natural hazards. No one country in meteorology can do this alone. It was recognized more than a century ago, and since then, the World Meteorological Organization provides essential leadership in cooperation globally. So every country would have contribution and also access to the global information and global services. We are operating the global public good system where many, many nations take responsibility to help others in exchanging prediction and sharing knowledge. The critical importance of WMO is that to serve as a framework of collaboration which allow members under the same standard and the same format which enable people can understand each other. The key factor WMO members contributed to the disastrous reduction is the improvement of weather forecasting accuracy. Now we can reach the same accuracy at seven days with a 90% of confidence in the you know, weather pattern. They say that's the science, the real advancement. All the governments, all the partners can rely on this information to take actions. In 2013, when Typhoon Haiyan struck Philippines, requested by the government of Vietnam, WMO organized an emergency response team comprises of the weather surface of China, Hong Kong, China, and also the regional center in Japan. And the evacuation of some 600,000 people was very effective in mitigating the hazard arising from Typhoon Haiyan. WMO provides regional and global support to all its members, each at different stages of socio-economic development. So in more developed countries, uh, systems are in place, uh, early alerts are in place, there's good response systems, but in many developing countries and small island states, uh, these systems are not in place, so um, the poverty and the lack of governance structures actually exacerbates the impact of disasters quite disproportionately. It's an encouraging fact that if we look at trends currently, less people die from disasters than they did 10 years ago. However, that trend is not homogeneous across all countries. And there are a number of countries, and particularly low-income countries and small island developing states, where that trend is reversed. That means that the number of people losing their lives to disasters is actually trending up. And that is very much the rationale behind this new initiative that WMO and a number of partners have launched called CRUISE, we're trying to help bridge the gap between some of the more advanced countries and those countries which don't have those systems in place. Zhongguo内地，我们承担了呃二十二个，就世界气象组的中心，通过这些中心呢来把我们的技术辐射出去，并且通过这中心呢来帮助其他发展中国家来加强能力的能力范围建设。我们中国政府每年提供奖学金，
Since the 1950s, WMO has pulled together its members from 191 states and territories to address the common challenges brought on by natural hazards. No one country in meteorology can do this alone. It was recognized more than a century ago, and since then, the World Meteorological Organization provides essential leadership in cooperation globally. So every country would have contribution and also access to the global information and global services. We are operating the global public good system where many, many nations take responsibility to help others in exchanging prediction and sharing knowledge. The critical importance of WMO is that to serve as a framework of collaboration which allow members under the same standard and the same format which enable people to understand each other. The key factor WMO members contributed to the disaster reduction is the improvement of weather forecasting accuracy. Now we can reach the same accuracy at seven days with a 90% of confidence in the weather pattern. This is that's the science. The real advancement, all the governments, all the partners can rely on this information to take actions. In 2013, when Typhoon Haiyan struck Philippines, requested by the government of Vietnam, WMO organized an emergency response team comprises of the weather surface of China, Hong Kong, China, and also the regional center in Japan and the evacuation of some 600,000 people was very effective in mitigating the hazard arising from Typhoon Haiyan. WMO provides regional and global support to all its members, each at different stages of socio-economic development. So in more developed countries, uh, systems are in place, uh, early alerts are in place, there's good response systems, but in many developing countries and small island states, uh, these systems are not in place, so um, the poverty and the lack of governance structures actually exacerbates the impact of disasters quite disproportionately. It's an encouraging fact that if we look at trends currently, less people die from disasters than they did 10 years ago. However, that trend is not homogeneous across all countries, and there are a number of countries, in particular low-income countries, and small island developing states where that trend is reversed. That means that the number of people losing their lives to disasters is actually trending up. And that is very much the rationale behind this new initiative that WMO and a number of partners have launched called CRUISE. We we're trying to help bridge the gap between some of the more advanced countries and those countries which don't have those systems in place. One can look up to see a piece of the blue sky. But together, we can see the skies of the Earth. WMO, we are really grateful and honored to, to be uh, winners of the UIC Wu Prize 2018. And we are planning to use the, the, the resources uh, uh, to enhance the global disaster risk reduction capacity, and especially support uh, uh, our developing country members in, in, in improving their, their service capability. Over the past two decades, changing climate has intensified natural disasters all over the world because hazards in one place are cautiously linked to weather conditions in the others. We at the United Nations Specialized Agency for, for Weather, Climate and Water and, and we are dealing with the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services which are responsibility for, for early warnings of, uh, of, of short-term weather events or climate issues and water resource management in the member countries. 
Since the 1950s, WMO has pulled together its members from 191 states and territories to address the common challenges brought on by natural hazards. No one country in meteorology can do this alone. It was recognized more than a century ago, and since then, the World Meteorological Organization provides essential leadership in cooperation globally. So every country would have contribution and also access to the global information and global services. We are operating the global public good system where many, many nations take responsibility to help others in exchanging prediction and sharing knowledge. The critical importance of WMO is that to serve as a framework of collaboration which allow members under the same standard and the same format which enable people can understand each other. The key factor WMO members contributed to the disastrous reduction is the improvement of weather forecasting accuracy. Now we can reach the same accuracy at seven days with a 90% confidence and in the weather pattern. They say that's the science, the real advancement. All the governments, all the partners can rely on this information to take actions. In 2013, when Typhoon Haiyan struck Philippines, requested by the government of Vietnam, WMO organized an emergency response team comprises of the weather surface of China, Hong Kong, China, and also the regional center in Japan and the evacuation of some 600,000 people was very effective in mitigating the hazard arising from Typhoon Haiyan. WMO provides regional and global support to all its members, each at different stages of socio-economic development. So in more developed countries, uh, systems are in place, uh, early alerts are in place, there's good response systems, but in many developing countries and small island states, uh, these systems are not in place, so um, the poverty and the lack of governance structures actually exacerbates the impact of disasters quite disproportionately. It's an encouraging fact that if we look at trends currently, less people die from disasters than they did 10 years ago. However, that trend is not homogeneous across all countries. And there are a number of countries, and particularly low-income countries, and small island developing states where that trend is reversed. That means that the number of people losing their lives to disasters is actually trending up. And that is very much the rationale behind this new initiative that WMO and a number of partners have launched called CRUISE, where we're trying to help bridge the gap between some of the more advanced countries and those countries which don't have those systems in place. One can look up to see a piece of the blue sky. But together, we can see the skies of the Earth. WMO, we are really grateful and honored to be winners of the UIC Wu Prize 2018. And we are planning to use the, the, the resources to enhance the global disaster risk reduction capacity, and especially support our developing country members in, in, in improving their their service capability. Over the past two decades, changing climate has intensified natural disasters all over the world because hazards in one place are cautiously linked to weather conditions in the others. We at the United Nations Specialized Agency for, for Weather, Climate and Water and, and we are dealing with the national meteorological and hydrological services which are responsibility for, for early warnings of, uh, of, of short-term weather events or climate issues and water resource management in the member countries. 
Since the 1950s, WMO has pulled together its members from 191 states and territories to address the common challenges brought on by natural hazards. No one country in meteorology can do this alone. It was recognized more than a century ago, and since then, the World Meteorological Organization provides essential leadership in cooperation globally. So every country would have contribution and also access to the global information and global services. We are operating the global public good system where many, many nations take responsibility to help others in exchanging prediction and sharing knowledge. The critical importance of WMO is that to serve as a framework of collaboration which allow members under the same standard and the same format which enable people to understand each other. The key factor WMO members contribute to the disaster reduction is the improvement of weather forecasting accuracy. Now we can reach the same accuracy at seven days with a 90% of confidence in the weather pattern. This is that's the science. The real advancement, all the governments, all the partners can rely on this information to take actions. In 2013, when Typhoon Haiyan struck Philippines, requested by the government of Vietnam, WMO organized an emergency response team comprises of the weather surface of China, Hong Kong, China, and also the regional center in Japan and the evacuation of some 600,000 people was very effective in mitigating the hazard arising from Typhoon Haiyan. WMO provides regional and global support to all its members, each at different stages of socio-economic development. So in more developed countries, uh, systems are in place, uh, early alerts are in place, there's good response systems, but in many developing countries and small island states, uh, these systems are not in place, so um, the poverty and the lack of governance structures actually exacerbates the impact of disasters quite disproportionately. It's an encouraging fact that if we look at trends currently, less people die from disasters than they did 10 years ago. However, that trend is not homogeneous across all countries, and there are a number of countries, in particular low-income countries, and small island developing states where that trend is reversed. That means that the number of people losing their lives to disasters is actually trending up. And that is very much the rationale behind this new initiative that WMO and a number of partners have launched called CRUISE, where we're trying to help bridge the gap between some of the more advanced countries and those countries which don't have those systems in place. One can look up to see a piece of the blue sky. But together, we can see the skies of the Earth. WMO, we are really grateful and honored to, to be uh, winners of the UIC Blue Prize 2018. And we are planning to use the, the, the resources uh, uh, to enhance the global disaster risk reduction capacity, and especially support uh, uh, our developing country members in, in, in improving their, their service capability. Over the past two decades, changing climate has intensified natural disasters all over the world because hazards in one place are cautiously linked to weather conditions in the others. We at the United Nations Specialized Agency for, for Weather, Climate and Water and, and we are dealing with the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services which are responsible for, for early warnings of, uh, of, of short-term weather events or climate issues and water resource management in the member countries. Since the 1950s, W.
Cantonese, and Channel 2 will be English. Please be seated. Our lecture is about to begin. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the Louis C. Wall Prize, Prize for World Civilization Laureate Public Lecture 2018. My name is Leah Chen. I am the master's student of Poly U with a major in applied math for science and technology, MC of today's lecture. We are honored to have Professor Tellus. Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization to be the speaker of today's event. The World Meteorological Organization is the Welfare Betterment Prize Laureate for the Louis C. Ward Prize 2018. Let's have a round of applause for Professor Petteri Tullos. <laughs> we are also pleased to have guests of the Louis C. Ward Prize Limited to be with us today. Welcome. To begin, may I first invite the president of Hong Kong Polytechnic University, Professor Timothy Tong, to deliver welcoming remarks. Professor Tong, please. Good morning. Last night, I had the uh, pleasure to attend the uh, Lucy Wu Prize presentation, and uh, I must say that even after the event, I felt so upbeat and excited because I saw the prize presentation to three really outstanding individuals or organizations. And today, we are very happy that a distinguished person from one of the organizations that received the Lu Chi Wu Prize will be sharing with us his insight about a topic that he personally is so concerned about. So um, let me also thank everyone associated with the Lu Chi Wu Prize uh, for having this partnership with Hong Kong Polytechnic University. I think since the establishment of the Lu Chi Wu Prize every year we have the opportunity to host a lecture 
by one of the laureates. And uh, let me uh, introduce the chairman of the price recommendation committee to you, responsible for producing this prize winner who will be speaking to us today. And he is a good friend, Professor Lawrence Lau. Why don't we give a round of applause <laughs> to Professor Lau. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see a lot of good friends in the audience. They are actually also helping the Lee Chi Wo uh, Prize uh, Foundation. So welcome you all. And earlier you heard the introduction of Professor Katiri Tallis. I'd like to, just for my own pleasure, introduce him one more time. He's the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization. Professor Petiri Tallis, would you please stand up so that we can see you? Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. The World Meteorological Organization oftentimes is referred to the WMO in short. WMO is the winner of the Welfare Betterment Prize of the Lee Ji Woo Prize this year. And um, in a moment, Professor Tallis would deliver the lecture entitled Towards a Weather and Climate Resilient World. I think this lecture cannot be more timely. For those of you who are local, or at least as of three weeks ago, you're local, you remember the typhoon that blew through Hong Kong. I think all in all, we survived extremely well. And thanks to the good work of the uh, local government, and of course their good work could not have been so outstanding without actually using the uh, technology and the information that is uh, uh, provided by the WMO. So I know we have the observatory director right here. The logo. Let's give him a, a round of applause too. Huh? <laughs> Welcome, thank you. Congratulations on your good work. Yeah, yeah. And before we walked in, he actually gave me a challenge. <laughs> May I share your challenge with them? Uh -huh. He said he wanted to play guitar with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a date between us, okay? <laughs> okay, back to a serious uh, business. Um, as we all know, nowadays, it seems like every year, uh, the severe climate events that we come across are uh, getting more and more severe. Uh, years ago, I remember hearing that uh, we may have this once every hundred year flood. It seems like this once a hundred year flood is happening every year. <laughs> okay. and, and the storms are getting more and more inten intense. So how are we going to improve our ability to prepare for these severe climate events? I think WMO has an excellent way to help us to face this kind of challenge. And I think the key is through international cooperation. WMO facilitates free exchange of meteorological information among its members. And they have 191 member states and territories. And what the members do is that they share information for the purpose of disaster risk reduction, uh, public safety, and environmental protection. They enhance the monitoring, forecasting, and communication of meteorological hazards on a global scale. And their work has been proven effective over the past 50 years, WMO has played an important role in reducing global loss of life from extreme weather, climate, and water-related events tenfold. That's really impressive. So today, we are very honored to have Professor Tallis to share with us WMO's persistent efforts in developing a framework for international cooperation to tackle severe climate. But before I turn the floor to Professor Tallis, I must also introduce a few more 
individuals with uh, to you. Um, uh, Alex, Mr. Alex Loy, he's from the Loy's family. Yes, welcome, welcome. And uh, Bettina, his lovely wife. <laughs> Bettina. And also uh, Francis, uh, uh, better half. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Loy. Okay. Francis is, has not arrived yet, right? Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, without further ado, let me turn the podium to uh, Professor Talis. Professor Talis, please. So, good morning, everybody, and it's a great uh, pleasure to be in Hong Kong. And, uh, and uh, I was here last time uh, three years ago, and I, I learned to know the excellent work that the Hong Kong Observatory is doing here. And uh, I, I learned to know that you have a very well developed country, and, uh, and, and everything here works like a Swiss, uh, Swiss clock. Uh, in June uh, last summer, I got a call from uh, Hong Kong and uh, and Professor Lawrence was uh, calling me, and he was asking whether whether I would be ready to receive the Louis Chivu uh, Prize of this year. And uh, it was a great uh, surprise to me, and uh, a very ple pleasant uh, surprise. And uh, and and it was uh, this time it was I had a very very pleasant uh, reason to come to come to Hong Kong. And uh, and uh, and uh, I will tell you now uh, what uh, what we know about uh, climate change. Uh, for me personally, being at the technical university, it's uh, it's very interesting. My older son uh, uh, graduated from uh, Helsinki Te Technological University a year ago from biomedical technology, and uh, my younger son just started his studies at the same university studying process uh, technology, so I have also that kind of blood uh, in my family. And before coming to WMO, I used to be chairman of the board of University of Eastern Finland, which is the uh, third biggest uh, university of Finland, so, so also this kind of academic uh, world is very common, common to me. And uh, for the first 15 years of my career, I, I, was, uh, I was a scientist and, uh, and became a professor, and, uh, and, and thereafter I became a bureaucrat. Uh, running the Med Service of Finland, which is a half research institute. And uh, for the past three years, I've been working for World Meteorological Organization, which is, uh, which is um, science and technology-based uh, organization of the U United Nations uh, family. So I, I'm going to tell you uh, about uh, disasters, uh, uh, climate change, and, uh, and also I'm touching what, uh, what, what you are doing here in, in Hong Kong, and, and you're also very much contributing with this uh, these issues that I'm going to show you in, in this presentation. So we are the United Nations Specialized Agency on, on weather, climate, and, uh, and, and water. And almost all of the United Nations uh, members, they are also members of WMO. We have only two, two countries missing from our portfolio. And we are very much coordinating the work of uh, 200,000 uh, experts at the national level and, uh, and, and the experts of uh, Hong Kong observatory, they are also very much contributing to the work of, uh, of WMO. We, we established the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, in the late uh, 70s, and the first report was published in 88.
uh, constellation. We have uh, North American, uh, European, Chinese, uh, Russian, Indian satellite, and uh, how to optimize uh, the use of, uh, of, of various nas national and regional programs. That's very much the duty of, uh, of us. And, and the satellite technology has been getting fancier and fancier. We can, we can do a much better job today compared to the situation in during the past, uh, the past uh, decades. And uh, for example, Chinese satellites are nowadays uh, at a very high level, which wasn't the case uh, 20 years ago. And, and we have one of the fathers of uh, Chinese satellite programs, my assistant secretary general, Wen Xian Sang, also present here, here today. Okay. So, sorry. We lost it. So, uh, and we have uh, also setting, we have been setting standards for various uh, observations and, uh, and your Hong Kong observatory has been contributing to the cloud uh, ob observation systems and we just published a new cloud atlas uh, last year and, uh, and, and, and there was a great job done by, by Hong Kong observatory behind, uh, behind that. So uh, perhaps you have seen that we have been able to improve the forecast uh, skills. Uh, for example, this uh, recent uh, typhoon Mangut uh, was seen only two weeks uh, ahead and, uh, and, and uh, your country had, uh, had one week time to, to, to prepare for, 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 for the event. And, and it was very well forecasted and, uh, and, and there were no casualties here in, in Hong Kong. So we have been able to enhance the quality of the forecasts and uh, in the past we used to have a gap between the northern hemispheric uh, 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 forecast skills and the southern hemispheric uh, forecast skills. There was this kind of gap. For example, in, in northern hemisphere the, the, the accuracy was more than 85 percent and, and in southern hemisphere just above 70 percent. And, and this, is, this has uh, practically disappeared and that's very much because of uh, satellite uh, observations. And, uh, and also, if you look at this uh, trend here, you can see that uh, the accuracies are getting much better and something that we were able to forecast uh, three, three days ahead uh, in the past, we can now forecast uh, seven days uh, ahead. That's observing systems, scientific improvement and, uh, and also bigger supercomputing resources that we have available today. And, and this is not going to be the end of the end of the story. We have a couple of uh, United Nations agreements uh, dealing with uh, su the substance of WMO. We have Sendai framework, which is uh, very much promoting uh, capacity development on, on disaster risk reduction, and, and that's one of the one of the backbones of uh, our, our work. About 90% of the disasters that we observe worldwide, they are related to weather. So that's why the, the national Weather services like Hong Kong Observatory, they are key players, uh, players in, in, in reaching the targets of Sendai Agreement. We have another holy, holy book, uh, somebody may say it's Koran or Bible or what, whatever you prefer. Uh, that's Sustainable Development Goals and uh, there are 17 of, of the goals and uh, and majority of those goals are somehow related to uh, disasters, uh, climate uh, change or of water, water resource management. And that's why uh, the weight and, and, and uh, need for WMO activities has been dramatically growing. And uh, that's also seen in the, in the UN family here. We, have, uh, we are meeting uh, with 30 UN heads of a a agencies meeting on annual basis or actually twice a year. And, uh, and, and uh, many of our sister organizations, they have been eager to enhanced cooperation with us and, and uh, during my term we have been signing new agreements with uh, several of them. Agriculture is one of the sectors. Health, uh, you have Margaret Chan who used to run World Health Organization from, from your country. We have uh, also the uh, transport sector is, is very much uh, in, interested in cooperation with us. IKEO, which is run by a Chinese uh, colleague. IMO is run by a South Korean colleague, and, and, and then we have also other, other agencies that are, are dealing with us. 
and, and we are also in, inside the UN family, we are, we are the expert organization on climate, uh, climate matters, and I'm personally very much advising Secretary General Guterres on, on, on climate matters. Here we are, for example, attending the One Belt uh, event in Beijing, which was carried out a couple of, uh, couple of years ago. And, and we are also very much contributing to the U United Nations climate negotiations. Here I'm speaking as an opening speaker at the last, last COP meeting, and, and then we are also contributing to the United Nations uh, General Assembly, which was held uh, last week in New York. There was, I had a chance to be present as well. So then uh, we have, uh, besides the observing systems, we have uh, we are also supporting global data and forecasting centers and uh, and uh, WMO works like a family. We are very very freely exchanging data, but we are also very freely exchanging know-how between various uh, centers and uh, and the global centers are providing uh, these uh, long-term forecasts uh, with global models and. Uh, and they are useful for, for also for Hong Kong. Uh, with, without those, uh, you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't have been able to forecast the Mangut uh, two weeks uh, ahead. And, and we are strengthening those uh, those centers uh, in our everyday functions. We have also climate uh, uh, climate centers and, and uh, climate outlook fora, and uh, and 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 this part of uh, of uh, of uh, world is uh, hosted by. By Hong Kong Observatory, and we were just signing new agreement with Hong Kong uh, two days uh, ago, which is contributing to this climate uh, climate uh, service uh, activities as well. And one of the uh, challenges that we are dealing with is uh, air quality, and here is uh, one pollutant, NO2, which is very much coming from uh, traffic and uh, energy energy sector. And uh, if you look at the map, you can see some. Uh, colored areas, especially with the black color, and uh, unfortunately, you are in, in, in an area which is uh, one of the most polluted in the whole whole world. So there's a, there's an air quality challenge, and that's also that's also health uh, health challenge. I, I was looking at the air quality statistics for yesterday, and uh, Hong Kong wasn't a very uh, pleasant place because of uh, of, of uh, high level of uh, pollution, and and that's one of the challenge is how to how to improve that and uh, and uh, by uh, mitigating this problem one can uh, often mitigate also climate the problem so it's uh, it's a little bit different emissions but uh, but still uh, that's a, that's a challenge and the government of china has an ambitious pr uh, program to solve this uh, this problem these problems are also fairly new in india where they have uh, very polluted cities like uh, new delhi and classically Europe used to be very polluted, but uh, the situation has been improving quite a bit. And, and there has been also an improvement in, in, in the USA, which also used to be fairly polluted, especially the east coast of, uh, of USA. Uh, we are also dealing with uh, health uh, services, and, uh, and we have different scales here. We have this air quality uh, challenge, uh, which is health, uh, health issue, and, and then we have also so-called vector-borne diseases, the outbreak of uh, malaria, cholera, dengue fever, and that kind of diseases, they depend on the weather conditions before the out outbreak, and, and by issuing seasonal predictions, one can also also uh, forecast what's going to happen happen in the health, uh, health sector. And, and by having such services, one could uh, better prepare uh, to, to mitigate uh, the health, uh, health problems. And, and you have been able to create, uh, for example, the Hong Kong Heat index here, which is uh, highly, highly useful in, in, in uh, index uh, worldwide. And here you can see uh, uh, my colleague from uh, Hong Kong Observatory, CM Chun, who has been doing excellent uh, work here, and he's is a well, a very well known character also worldwide because of, of those uh, achievements. And. Uh, and, uh, and and there, have, there has been a study uh, what is the economic benefit of uh, of our work and uh, and the work of our national national services and uh, and we have very positive uh, numbers to show that uh, there are uh, several hundreds of uh, hundreds of lives uh, saved uh, every year like like what happened here during the uh, uh, typhoon mangut and and we have been able to avoid uh, uh, several billions uh, euros of disaster losses and, uh, and, and we have produced uh, tens of billions of euros additional benefits uh, 
uh, every year because of, of, of the services. So, so investments in our sector, they are also economically viable. World Bank has uh, shown that uh, once you invest in, in national services, you gain the money back uh, uh, at, at least uh, twofold uh, or, or sometimes uh, ev even 14, 14 fold. Uh, so so uh, what, what I'm recommending to governments is to invest more in, in, in such services. And, uh, and we had a very good meeting yesterday morning with your chief executive and uh, she, she also very well understood that it's, it's, it's worthwhile to invest. And uh, the savings that you were having uh, during the last uh, typhoon event, uh, they were just one, one demonstration that uh, what, what, what you gain once you have uh, fancy, fancy uh, early warning services. And uh, the things that I'm talking about, that's, those are also very well understood by the economy sector. We are having uh, an annual, annual basis uh, uh, World Economic Forum in, in Davos, and, and during the past two years, uh, they have been estimating what are the biggest risks for the global e economy on an annual basis, and, uh, and uh, in 2017 and also this year, they estimated that uh, extreme weather events, natural disasters, and failure of climate uh, change mitigation adaptation, they are the biggest, uh, bi biggest risk. And the high impact uh, issue would be nuclear war, that's very much related to the development in North Korea, but the likelihood of that event is not very, very high. But of course, the impact would be, would be fairly, fairly high. So, so, economy sector very well understands uh, what is the what is the value of our our business. So then I'm very happy to show you some statistics uh, concerning disasters. This is a map showing. Uh, graph showing uh, what has happened to the uh, uh, disasters, uh, big disasters worldwide, uh, right? uh, this uh, typhoon Mangut or, or severe uh, events uh, worldwide, uh, they are the ones that we have uh, on this, uh, this slide. And, uh, and if you look at this blue, it's hydrological events, it's very much flooding problem, and, uh, and the green one is, uh, is, is, is storms, and uh, then we have heat waves, which is the uh, the, the orange color here, and, and uh, the majority of the of the disasters they are related to storms and uh, and flooding. <coughs> and this part of the world is uh, is the most sensitive a area, and, and, and that's the area where we have uh, largest amount of those uh, those disasters. And it's a little bit misleading to talk about global warming. It's uh, the heat waves are are one of the uh, uh, is issue here. But the majority of the of, of the issues uh, and the increase is mostly seen in the amount of uh, flooding and, uh, and and storms. So therefore, the warming is not uh, perhaps the most interesting thing uh, globally. And if you look at the casualties that we have seen related to disasters since the since the 50s, which is the graph here, in the 50s and 60s, we used to have plenty of uh, casualties. And we have been seeing very positive development here. We have been able to avoid casualties, and that's because of uh, improved early warning services. But what is most striking is that the economic losses have been growing very rapidly, and uh, we cannot uh, fully mitigate those. We can, we can uh, adapt to those uh, things and, and uh, minimize certain risks, but, uh, but, uh, but this, this evolution is, uh, is not very positive. So we have. Uh, seen a threefold increase in the, in the economic losses related to disasters uh, in, during the past, uh, past 30 years. And last year, as a single year, was the most expensive year. We had losses of the order of 330 billion US, US dollars. Here are some statistics showing what kind of casualties we have seen related to uh, uh, tropical cyclones, which are uh, during the past uh, past uh, 25 years, uh, no, during the past uh, uh, more than 100 years, and, and these are always uh, 4,000 people, so this is 300,000 people. And so far, the worst case has been the uh, uh, tropical storm that was hitting, hitting Bangladesh, and, uh, and also the second one is, uh, is, is Bangladesh. It's typically the poorest countries who are suffering, suffering the mo most, and uh, their infrastructures and adaptation capacities uh, is lowest. And, and many of these uh, events are, have been observed in, in Asian, Asian part of the world. 
and economic losses, uh, they are highest in, in, in a developed world and, and so far the most expensive single event has been the Hurricane Katrina, which was uh, destroying half of, the, of, of New Orleans. And there were also, also more than 1,000 casualties uh, there. And, and, and also we have, we, we can see that the Asian, Asian numbers are, are, are here, but the, but the, the US, US costs have been, have been highest so far. And as I said, last year was the most expensive year so far. And, uh, and, and we can prevent uh, loss of lives, as, as, as I was uh, saying, and, uh, and, and, and these early warning services, they are, they are very much uh, uh, the, the factor behind that, and, and that's perhaps the reason why we were able to become the laureates of uh, Earth Wu Prize uh, this year. So, so that, uh, and this is uh, uh, work coordinated by WMO, but it's, it's very much run at the national level, and, and this, uh, this, this national National level level work is the is, is the is where we have this uh, touch to the general public. Then I will show you a couple of uh, cases. Uh, there was a super typhoon Haiyan uh, five years ago, and, uh, and and where we played a role. And uh, again, the losses were were, were the largest uh, in in less developed countries, and it was hitting uh, both Philippines and. Uh, and Vietnam, where the, where the infrastructures were not uh, as persistent as, 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 as is the case here in, in, in Hong Kong. And uh, we, ha we had uh, the most severe uh, typhoon hitting, hitting Japan uh, during the past 25 years, Jebi, and, uh, and there were casualties and, and there were also major economic losses. And typically, it's not only the wind speed that is causing problems, but it's uh, is the storm surges on the, in the coastal areas and uh, and also large amounts of, uh, of of rainfall. And and this was the case that you were uh, familiar with and uh, and and it it, it 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 has been the most intense uh, tropical storm super typhoon of this year. And and there's the next one which is, which is going to hit uh, Japan and uh, South Korea uh, during the coming coming weekend, and it's also category four, uh, category five, uh, uh, five tropical, uh, tropical uh, storm. And, uh, and here, there was uh, lots of damage to the forest. I had a chance to uh, have a hol helicopter flight uh, around uh, Hong Kong yesterday, and, uh, and we saw lots of uh, forest damage uh, be caused by that. And there was some damage to the infrastructures, but, uh, but uh, no casualties. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's great. And, uh, and why you were so successful, uh, we, we first you got the early warnings and, and you have very powerful way to, 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 uh, to, to transfer that information to the general public. It's lots of uh, mobile phone based services, uh, Facebook services and, and also web page uh, services and, uh, and the machinery here in, in, in Hong Kong functions uh, very well. So. That, that kind of know-how we should uh, transfer to the remaining uh, hundreds of our members that don't have such, uh, such uh, services. And uh, uh, you have also techno to technological means to uh, contribute to the uh, uh, forecasting of, uh, of uh, tropical storms. Uh, you, you have aircraft and uh, you can drop a uh, measuring device uh, called drop sonde uh, into the eye of, uh, of a tropical storm, and, and that gives you more information on the strength and, uh, and uh, how, how it's going to behave. And, and uh, uh, we have agreed that we will promote uh, the use of uh, Hong Kong aircraft uh, for such uh, purposes in the, f in the future. And, and if, if one could fly in the uh, airspace of, uh, of uh, Philippines and, and Taiwan, uh, there would be better, better forecasts also for, for Hong Kong and, uh, and, and China area. And what's happening now is that, uh, that we have started seeing, as the, as the, as the president said, uh, that something that used to happen every 100 years in the past uh, seemed to happen, happen not every year today, but, uh, but, uh, but more often. And, and that's what's happening because of climate change. We sometimes observe certain things every 30 years uh, we can nowadays observe them every five years, and in the future, perhaps, uh, 
every second, uh, second year. And some of these uh, phenomena have existed already in the past, but the frequency is changing. That's happening to the storms, it's happening to the heat waves, and it's also happening to the flooding, flooding events. And, and we have uh, had plenty of uh, extreme weather worldwide, perhaps I don't go to the details, but it's not only, only this part of the world where we have seen unusual things, uh, things happening. And we have also seen heat waves and unusual events uh, in Asia and, and also, also Africa and, uh, and, and Europe. And, and uh, Japan as a country has been suffering quite a bit uh, this year. Uh, the uh, Japanese ambassador of, uh, of, uh, in, in Geneva is saying that uh, Japan is a department store of uh, disasters. They have everything. They have, uh, they have earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, uh, storms, uh, flooding, so forth, and heat waves as well. And then uh, how well the countries are ready to face these, uh, these challenges, uh, this map, uh, with the red colors is showing where we have the most vulnerable areas and, uh, and, and the green colors indicate countries which are better prepared to face, uh, face the problems. And Africa as a continent is, uh, is most colorful, so most African countries are very vulnerable uh, to disasters and that's also the case in southern part of, uh, part of Asia, so you can see here. For example, Vietnam is exposed to uh, m many disasters, but they have been investing in early warning services and they, are, they have dramatically improved, uh, improved, improved their performance. But uh, some of the low-lying countries, uh, India, Bangladesh, they are very vulnerable and uh, you can see here nearby also, also countries that need uh, assistance. And we, at the moment, uh, we have a so-called warning system uh, which is covering the European countries and uh, we have agreed that we will, we will improve uh, such a system to have worldwide uh, coverage and, and Hong Kong Observatory is contributing to this, uh, this uh, enterprise and, uh, and we will use a fraction of the Le Chi Vu, uh, price uh, funding to improve the global, global system. And, and the idea is that we would have uh, global coverage of such, a, such an early warning service uh, and the first step is to have uh, some Asian parts uh, included in the system and, and uh, gradually to have uh, global, global coverage. And uh, inside the United Nations system uh, we have plenty of uh, humanitarian organizations that would benefit from early warning services and, and we have started uh, as a te on a test base to provide services for various players like World Health Organization, FAO, World Food Program and so forth and, and uh, we will establish a permanent service next year and, uh, and, and, and this global uh, alarm system is going to be backbone of, uh, of that and, and we will also invest some of the Le Chi Vu price uh, funding for, for such a purpose. Okay, and then the last part of my presentation is going to deal with uh, climate change. So what we have observed in climate change uh, so far, uh, this is uh, the global temperature graph uh, since 1850s and you can see that there's been something happening here and we have uh, exceeded 1.1 degree warming so far. And, and there's uh, va variability from year to year and so far the warmest year was 2016 uh, it was uh, because of climate change, but there was a uh, strong El Nino event which was boosting, boosting the warming. And, and this year has been so-called La Nina year when, when the temperatures in the, in the ocean areas have been lower and, and that's why uh, we, haven't seen, we, have, we haven't been breaking the record. But next year we expect to see at least a weak uh, El Nino, so we may again break, uh, break temperature records. And uh, the backbone of those uh, uh, observations are, are long-term measurements and uh, we are happy to have uh, one of the so-called centennial stations, uh, Hong Kong, and, and your observations uh, are also important for, for such an em enterprise. Here you have to, have to uh, correct the heat island. Uh, there's much more concrete and, uh, and uh, paved uh, environment as compared to the situation 100 years ago and uh, we have to correct that in the in the data when we, when we make these, uh, these calculations. But to detect uh, one degree 
transforming from uh, from from such a data that's that's quite a quite a challenge and uh, because of the standardized observations we can we can detect uh, such, a, such a fairly small signal actually and we have stored 90% uh, of the extra heat that we have produced to the planet to the oceans and and uh, the oceans have been warming by half degree so far and, and because of the warmed oceans, we, we get more power to the tropical storms. And that's contributing to the strength of the tropical storms. And it's also contributing to the area where we, are, we can observe uh, tropical storms. So here is an estimation of what, uh, what, how, how the tropical storm situation is uh, today, in which areas and uh, how many category, uh, five, four, three, and so forth. Uh, storms we can observe and, and uh, this is uh, this is the estimation of what would happen if we would reach the Paris uh, two degree target so it, it would be it would already mean that we would have uh, wider areas uh, area of, uh, of tropical storms and, and we would observe more often category four and five uh, five uh, tropical cyclones hurricanes uh, uh, typhoons and uh, and cyclones so uh, so this is uh, this is this is already already happening. Uh, we have been also seeing a change in the sea level rise. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, we have a sea level rise of 26 centimeters so far. And we have measurements since 1870s, uh, first uh, based on th uh, tide gauges and, and more recently based on satellite uh, measurements, which, uh, which are very accurate in millimeter scale. And what has happened recently is that uh, there has been a, a trend upward, uh, we are now having more than three millimeters per year uh, sea level rise, whereas it used to be two millimeters per year in the past. And what are the factors behind this uh, sea level rise? Uh, uh, if you look at the last uh, uh, decade uh, statistics, it's thermal expansion. When we heat the seawater, it's expanding. And, uh, and then the glaciers uh, are melting. And especially the, uh, there has been a boost in the melting of the Greenland the glacier where we have about two kilometers thick, uh, thick uh, glacier. And if you compare the Greenland contribution in the past and, and today, it's almost increased uh, threefold. So far, the Antarctic glacier hasn't been melting too much, which is good news where we have a potential of uh, 50 meters sea level rise and, and this Greenland uh, 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 glacier has a potential of uh, seven to eight meters uh, sea level rise uh, globally. And how, how sensitive uh, the world is uh, to uh, uh, sea level rise and uh, storm surges and uh, where are the hotspots uh, from that perspective where you can see uh, a red area here, which is uh, very much uh, your part of the world. So, so here we have uh, plenty of uh, low-lying uh, uh, coastal cities and, uh, and lots of population. So, so this part of the world is most sensitive uh, to the sea level, uh, sea, sea level rise and uh, storm surges in the coastal, coastal areas. We have some others, uh, Istanbul, London, and, and, and European part of the world, and a couple of uh, US cities, and some African and uh, Latin American cities. But this is clearly, clearly the most, uh, most vulnerable area worldwide we have also seen changes in the in the water content of uh, lower atmosphere we are we have more evaporation and, and we have more water vapor in the lower atmosphere which is contributing to the uh, flooding problem and uh, and we have also already seen changes in the global precipitation patterns uh, this indicates uh, the brownish colors here indicate uh, Decrease of the of the global uh, of the precipitation. Uh, we have two periods here. We have uh, recent three decades and uh, an early part of the last century compared here. And you can see that Africa is getting much drier, and it's also also drought uh, is, is more prevailing here, and uh, at, at the high northern latitudes and uh, some some areas uh, in the southern hemisphere, we have seen an increase in the amount of uh, rainfall. We are publishing an annual uh, uh, state of climate uh, report where also other UN agencies are contributing. And this is an estimation of uh, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, uh, what has been the economic impact of uh, climate change uh, so far on, 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 on global 
global economy. And you can see that the no high northern latitudes, they have been benefiting. It's getting uh, warmer and, and, uh, and also wetter, which is po positive for the, for the uh, agriculture and, uh, and forestry se sector. But uh, if you look at the global map, you can see lots of red color, which indicates a negative impact on, on global GDP. And southern hemisphere and, uh, and the low latitudes have already suffered because of the, of the change. What's happening in the uh, uh, atmosphere and the concentrations of, uh, of uh, carbon dioxide, uh, here we have uh, two uh, sites. We have Mauna Loa, where they have measurements since the 50s, and one, one uh, which I, I used to run in my past. And you can see the same trend uh, in, in, in the Arctic and uh, in the tropical zone, and, and there's, there's a fairly dramatic increase, and, and so far no phase out of this, uh, this increase. The amplitude is different. Uh, in, 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 in tropics, you don't have uh, so much energy consumption, uh, which is the case uh, in the winter time in the Arctic, and uh, in summertime, the vegetation is, uh, is serving as a sink of, uh, of carbon. And we have uh, 800,000 years of, uh, of uh, uh, ice core drilling from Greenland and Antarctica, and we can estimate what, how, how has been the uh, concentration of the, of the three most important greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And in all of the cases, uh, the concentrations are today the highest in 800,000 uh, years. And we can go back uh, by using uh, 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 some sort of indirect methods. Uh, ice, first is ice cores, that's 800,000 years back, and, and we, by using Alkenones, uh, baron uh, isotopes, and leaf tomata, we can go back in history by 50 million years. And uh, there, have been, there has been natural variability in the past, but uh, this is 800,000 years. This, uh, here we have some estimations. Uh, what, is the, what, is the, what was the level last year? 400 ppm. And about 3 million years ago, we had a similar case. I will come back to. What, what, how, the, how the estimation of sea level and the temperature were at that time. And then we have uh, tens of millions of years. There have been cases where there was less uh, uh, vegetation in the, on the planet and, and, and the, uh, the carbon dioxide concentration was estimated to be even higher than today. And if we uh, want to understand uh, the carbon behavior, we have to know this carbon carbon cycle, uh, about 80 percent, uh, about 90 percent of the, of the increase uh, is uh, related to the use of fossil energy, and about 10 percent is related to especially deforestation in places like uh, Indonesia and uh, Brazil. And about half of the extra uh, carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere, but one third is taken by growing vegetation, and uh, about uh, one quarter is, uh, is uh, is taken by, by the oceans. And since oceans serve as a sink uh, for carbon, we are also changing the chemical composition of the, of the seawater. And here you can see what has happened to the uh, pH of, uh, of uh, seawater. We have seen a decrease uh, worldwide. And there's an estimated uh, estimation that uh, we have the lowest pH in 25 million years today. And at high latitudes, uh, this uh, sink is the strongest. And there we have seen the major changes. And this is going to be one of the long-term threats to the ocean, ocean eco ecosystems. We have seen changes in the, in the sea ice uh, coverage. This is from, uh, from the Arctic. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and so far, the lowest uh, amount of sea ice we have seen in 2012 when it comes to coverage. But for example, north of uh, Greenland, we have for the first time seen open open sea area, which is not covered by, by ice. In southern hemisphere, the situation is a little bit better. We have seen a decline also there, but, uh, but the differences uh, to the normal is that they are not so, not so dramatic as, as is the case in, in the northern, northern hemisphere. And perhaps the most dramatic changes have been seen in the amount of so-called multi-year ice. Uh, typically, we used to have uh, multi-year ice in the in the Arctic, uh, uh, which didn't melt uh, during the summertime, and, and this is the case in 84. Then we had uh, lots of, uh, for example, four-year-old ice, three-year, two-year, and one-year ice, old ice. 
but uh, today those multi-year ice uh, bars have practically disappeared. We have mostly one-year-old ice and the coverage of the ice cover is, uh, is, is, is much uh, smaller than, than in 84. And these changes in the Arctic, they are changing also the, the, the weather patterns uh, worldwide uh, and, uh, and some of the unusual weather patterns that we have observed outside of the Arctic area, they are related to the changes in the radiation balance and, and we have seen uh, more often cold spells uh, in Asia, uh, Europe and North America and some of the heat waves uh, that have been hitting, hitting uh, those areas, they are also related to the changes in the, in the Arctic. So what, is, uh, what, what are the challenges for the mankind for the coming, uh, coming centuries? This is a scale from, uh, from the past uh, IPCC report, which was published uh, four years ago. Here we have uh, uh, year 2000, and here we have uh, 500 years ahead from us. If we use all of the fossil uh, uh, energy sources, we would reach uh, five times the current uh, carbon dioxide concentration. and. Uh, and, uh, and that would mean eight degrees warmer planet, uh, which would persist for, for thousands of, uh, of years. And, uh, and, and if we would like to reach the lower limit of uh, Paris Agreement, uh, we should uh, stop using fossil energy fairly soon, and then we could stabilize the concentration of carbon dioxide uh, under 500 uh, ppm level. The two degree target uh, would mean uh, something like uh, uh, 600 ppm of carbon dioxide, a little bit higher than today, and uh, then we would have the two degree stabilization. And uh, in all of the cases, we expect to see the sea level rise to continue, and, uh, and it's the basis uh, of the order of uh, one meter per century in, in case of that we are not uh, stopping the emissions, and uh, it would continue for thousands of years until we have been, would have been melting the for the Antarctic and Greenland uh, ice, which would mean uh, something like 50 meters higher sea level than, than today. And even in the case of a two degree target, uh, we could reach uh, something like uh, half meter to one meter higher levels uh, uh, by the end of uh, next century. And uh, then we are, we are expecting to see changes also in the, in the precipitation patterns and, uh, and agricultural conditions, and perhaps I will go just to the agricultural conditions. Uh, this is uh, what, would, what we would see in three degrees warmer planet, which is uh, quite likely to happen if we are not very successful with the, with the implementation of Paris uh, Agreement. And the pledges of the countries, uh, so far they would indicate this three, three degree warmer planet, and this is what, what might happen to the global agricultural production capacity of our, our planet, and you can see lots of red color, which indicates that we would lose, lose a large fraction of the current uh, food production capacity of our planet, and at the same time, the population of, uh, of the world is growing. We expect to see 4 billion inhabitants in Africa by the end of this century, uh, uh, besides current uh, one billion. And this is to me the main concern related to climate change. How, how can we feed uh, the growing population of our planet uh, in, in such, uh, such a case? And, and there are some green areas, but these are not the most favorable areas for, for agriculture. For example, the Tibetan area would benefit, but uh, the agricultural conditions there are not very good. And that's the case also in, in Siberia or northern part of U Europe or some parts of, uh, of, of, of Canada. So that's, uh, that's my personal main concern. And where we are today with the emissions, uh, here you can see the emission graph. Uh, classically, USA and uh, Europe have been the biggest emitter, and uh, during the recent uh, 15 years, China has become the biggest emitter. And there has been also fairly dramatic growth in the emissions of uh, non-OECD countries. And uh, China has been able to phase out this growth, and that's also the case in Europe. And, uh, and, and, and USA. But these players are the key players, but we shouldn't forget about uh, this part uh, either. I promised to say uh, what, what was the case uh, uh, when, we, when we were exceeding 400 ppm last time. Uh, there was a, there, there's an estimation that that was uh, 3 million years ago, and, and then the temperatures were about 2 to 4 degrees warmer than today, and the sea level was uh, 10 to 30 meters higher than today. And if you, if you think of that, uh, 
number in Hong Kong, it's, it's not very good, uh, good news. So that's showing that already the current carbon dioxide concentration is a, is a risky level. And the challenge that we are having is that, uh, that uh, if we go to higher concentrations of carbon dioxide, it, uh, we are not returning back to the normal levels very soon. So if you would uh, read, for example, three times the current uh, carbon dioxide concentration, it would take up to 100,000 years to return back to the normal, normal levels. And that's why we have this only this 30 years window to solve this problem. And the solution has to come from, from this graph. So how, how we are using energy today, so we are, we are producing 85% of our energy today based on coal, oil and gas, and only 15% only is based on, on uh, nuclear, hydro and renewables. And, and we have uh, 30 years time to revert this graph, so we should uh, produce majority of our energy based on nuclear, hydro and renewables, uh, and, uh, and, and we should get, get rid of this, uh, this growth that we have seen, uh, especially in the oil and gas uh, consumption. So, with these uh, words, I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions and have further, further uh, discussions with you. Thank you. What an inspiring lecture. Please stay, Mrs. Tell. While they are setting up for the Q&A session, may I have the honor to ask you some question? As we all know, we are in the new era of the artificial intelligence. I wonder if there are any applications of that in WMO? Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, we are WMO as an organization and, and the meteorological community, we are uh, some sort of fathers of uh, big data. We have been always uh, producing lots of, uh, lots of data, so that means uh, So we have been uh, always producing lots of data uh, in, in our forecasting models and also in, in our observing systems. And uh, we have been able to stack any supercomputer that's be, that has been invented. So we have uh, always been dealing with uh, big data and, uh, and, and that gives us uh, opportunities for, for new applications. And uh, both the public sector and private sector, they are at the moment very much dealing with uh, those uh, issues and, and we have also private sector players uh, like uh, IBM or Google, Google which are dealing with, uh, with those, uh, those issues and, uh, and, and uh, there are already plenty of new applications uh, for various sectors uh, developed and, and we expect that uh, trend uh, to continue and even give a, give a boost. And what is happening now is that uh, there's a trend uh, to go more towards uh, uh, impact-based forecasting. It's not only uh, only temperature, precipitation, or wind uh, that we are forecasting, but it's it's more the impact of the of the weather, where this artificial intelligence uh, can can play a role. And uh, for example, in your case, when you have uh, uh, these typhoons hitting your country, uh, one one can estimate what is what what's gonna, what kind of uh, damage there's going to be, and and. Uh, and, and you can you can target certain certain activities according to those, and that's what's happening in in the developed countries today. And we have to transfer that know-how also to less uh, less developed countries to, to to maximize the economic impact of uh, of our work. Thank you so much. Let's move on to the Q and A section. Please have a seat. Thank you. May I invite Professor Shaoli Ding, Associate Dean, Partnership of the Faculty of Construction and Environment to join us. Professor Ding, please. Hi, hello, uh, good morning to you all. Um, after hearing the very wonderful uh, presentation uh, by Professor Talas, yeah. uh, now it's uh, our chance to have some dialogues with Professor Talas. So uh, if you have any questions to ask, or if you have any comments to make, now is our chance. Uh, I understand that there are some uh, secondary school students in the audience. Um, it's very pleasing, really, to see that uh, the younger generations actually care about the world we are living in. And uh, they are concerned about the issues we are discussing today. So can I propose we reserve 
the first question to the secondary school students, if you have a question. Um, I can see some of you are here. Do you have any questions for us? Uh, <laughs> for the secondary school students. Right. <laughs> OK. Um, Perhaps you can uh, think about it, and uh, we will give you a chance to ask more questions later. So the first question will be asked by Professor uh, Chi. Uh, so, um, yeah. I, I have a simple one, because your last uh, sort, of, uh, sort of part is talk about the impact-based weather forecast. And in uh, Canada, especially in Toronto, we already say today the temperature is 25 degrees, but it feels like 32. How do you do that? So, so, so that's uh, so we have to. Uh, if you go to this impact-based forecast, you have to deal with uh, the customers of those uh, of, of, of those services, uh, and uh, it's a dialogue between the, the users and customers of the data and, 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 and the med services. Uh, how you develop the impact-based uh, forecasting, and and, uh, and that's what the uh, audience and, and the customers actually actually need. And here in, uh, in Hong Kong, for example, you have been able to develop uh, world-leading expertise in aviation, aviation services, the cooperation between, between the Hong Kong Observatory and uh, Cathay Pacific. It's, it, it, it's great, and it's, it's a great example for the rest of the world. And by using the services of uh, Hong Kong Observatory, Cathay Pacific has been able to optimize its, uh, its usage of uh, fleet and uh, and they have been able to achieve uh, both savings and, uh, and they have been also able to enhance the safety of, uh, of flights, as, 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 as an example. Yeah, uh, Professor Tang would like to ask the second question. So I have to give this chance to my boss. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, only if we are waiting for the students. <laughs> but uh, a question I have is, um, what you do has to rely on uh, having uh, data, lots of data, and hopefully data, uh, accurate data, right? But um, g gathering accurate data sometimes is a real challenge. And of course, when people uh, think about this problem, most of the time they think about gathering accurate data from developing countries because their system is not well developed. And, but I think recently, okay, uh, even in um, perhaps one of the most advanced countries, what happened in Puerto Rico, it seems like we are having a tough time just to um, have, have access to accurate data concerning the damage to Puerto Rico. So how, how would your organization deal with a situation like that? That's a good question. And, uh, and uh, what, is, what has been the, uh, the WMO has had uh, two very specific roles uh, in, 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 in gathering the data. First, uh, one of the reasons why WMO was established or I, IMO was established in 1870 was that uh, there was need to standardize the observations that were made uh, in, in uh, worldwide. So if, 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 you, if you use different methods for observing uh, um, pressure, which is, for example, a very important parameter for the, for the flights, without uh, accurate pressure measurement, me measurements, we would uh, have uh, lots of accidents in the air traffic and uh, and also it was important to uh, standardize the measurements of, uh, of uh, temperature and of course all all the weather parameters and and only by standardizing the, uh, the observations uh, we, we can have this global global network and the other nice thing of WMO besides this setting the standards is that we have uh, we are freely exchanging data so uh, uh, we have uh, real-time uh, free exchange of data and, and that has been valid even during the days of Cold War. Uh, despite of uh, political blocks, we have always been exchanging all the observational data freely. And, and that's the backbone of, uh, of, of, of weather services. We couldn't uh, have the global forecasting models run 
without that kind of input uh, data. And, and more recently, satellite data has, be, has become uh, highly, highly, highly valuable. And, and this uh, impact issue, that's, that's another story. And again, what kind of impacts we have seen in, in for example, Caribbean islands because of the record-breaking hurricane season last year. That's, uh, that's something where we are working together with, uh, with various uh, communities. And, and many other communities would benefit from, from, from our experience, how we exchange uh, data, and we are also exchanging know-how fairly, fairly freely. For example, you have uh, world-leading expertise here at the Hong Kong Observatory, and, and, and many other WMO members are benefiting from, uh, from that, uh, uh, that expertise. And, and this Le Chibu price uh, uh, finance uh, will allow, again, uh, exchange of that, uh, that know-how in, in, in an optimal way. I can see uh, a question from here. Thank, thank you very much for a, a wonderful presentation. You had some, um, some financial information in there. Uh, you showed great vulnerability to Africa. You also showed that the GDP will go, uh, will be most worsely affected globally in the same area. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of extreme events, you demonstrated that um, the, the highest damages were essentially in richer states. Uh, now, <coughs> this creates, in meteorological terms, if you want, uh, a separation about the interests of uh, the northern hemisphere in better prediction of extreme events and reducing vulnerability for these events. Do you feel optimistic that climate change obligations will be uh, honored by the northern countries? Because from, from, from what you've shown, they don't really have an interest in climate change. They're going to benefit from that. That has been the discussion. I'm, I'm originally coming from Finland, and uh, and, 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 and and also have uh, been uh, watching the discussion in Russia, and uh, and uh, and it's very well understood that uh, that uh, some of those countries are already gaining. I, I could show this IMF uh, graph with the green colors, uh, showing that the high northern latitudes have already been benefiting because of higher temperatures and uh, and, and more precipitation, which is. Uh, enhancing the growth of forests, and uh, it's also, it has been also already uh, meaning uh, a longer period, uh, longer growing season for the, for the agriculture and, and, and less need for heating of the, of the houses and so forth. But it's, it's very well understood that uh, those countries are also uh, sensitive to extreme events. And, and there was, for example, 2010 summer, there was a heat wave hitting, hitting Russia where they got 50,000 uh, casualties and, uh, and severe forest fires and peat uh, fires, and that was changing the, the, the mindset up of some decision makers in that country. But nowadays, uh, the economies and, and also the, the, the ag agricultural sector is uh, so much uh, in interconnected that uh, we cannot isolate the countries economically although there are some uh, current trends in some countries where they think that they could, they could isolate their economies from the, from the global economy. And, and this, this is very much the case uh, in climate change. If, if, if the whole world is going to suffer because of climate change, it's going to have impacts uh, also on those countries, which uh, might have some, some, some small benefits. Uh, in the end, uh, those countries are not going to gain either. Tell us, may I ask a very simple and naive question on behalf of uh, students and ordinary citizens. What can we do to prevent the climate warming or at least to lessen the effect and to save the world or whatever is left of it? Yeah, so we have, I, I think that this uh, problem uh, needs a solution from, uh, from, the, from the governments and uh, and, and regional players like European Commission and, and, and uh, these governments are setting certain standards uh, for how the energy is uh, produced in the, in the country. And in, in your, your case, for example, these uh, coal-fired power plants may not be the long-term solution and, and, and the government uh, may also have an impact on the, on the transport uh, sector, uh, what kind of uh, vehicles you are going to use and uh, how much you use uh, 
public transportation. But individuals can also play a role here. So it's, uh, it's this means of transportation. We have uh, uh, environment-friendly solutions, for example, electric vehicles uh, would improve the air quality challenge that you are having in the country. And at, at the same time, we could have uh, low emission uh, 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 solutions. Of course, if you produce your coal in Hong Kong based on coal, uh, this uh, does not help, but if in the future, if you have uh, some other means of, uh, of producing energy here, uh, these electric vehicles would be one, one solution. And one sector where, you, where the individual con consumers can, can play a role is, uh, is, is the diet. So it's, it's shown that uh, vegetarian diet is more, uh, more environment friendly and it may be also more healthy and uh, fish-based uh, diet is also something. And, uh, if you have very beef-based uh, diet, that's, uh, that's negative, uh, especially from, from methane emission perspective. And, and consumer power is something that also the industry is very much uh, looking at. Uh, during the past decades, we have changed our diet quite a bit. Uh, we, you print in the products uh, what kind of uh, calories you have and uh, what is the content of uh, each indi individual uh, product and, uh, and my guess is that in the future we will we may see the carbon foot, footprint the printed in the in the products and and, and you can also uh, make such uh, choices uh, and also living they, uh, how much uh, <coughs> space you have and uh, how you heat or cool your your buildings that's uh, there you can have an have an impact uh, here you are of course having big buildings but in, in single family houses you can use geothermal heating structures and and uh, solar energy-based uh, cooling structures. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we have one more question, the last question. Um, just check uh, the high school students. Do you have any questions for us? Last young. Uh, I can see a question from here. Can I give the chance to him? Sorry for that. Hello, Professor. I'm a PolyU student, and uh, I want to <coughs> ask uh, uh, as we all know, the uh, employment uh, uh, condition of the environmental protect is not uh, so popular that uh, like the accountants or finance or some management. So I want to uh, ask, uh, do you do, uh, does the WMO make the effort to provide more uh, the employment uh, chance for our, for us young generation to devote ourselves to protect our over the earth yeah so wmo is a is a scientific and technical organization and and we are not the political player so we are not uh, giving uh, instructions to individual governments how they should uh, behave but uh, but we are uh, ha having this kind of uh, we are uh, giving this kind of information available for for decision makers and, uh, and and for the general public, and uh, and they can withdraw certain 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 conclusions from from such material as, as uh, I was just uh, just showing. And uh, and and the good news uh, today is, is that uh, that also private sector and finance sector has has, has heard this message. And uh, I was just uh, last week in New York. Uh, listening to heads of state uh, and, and they are they are very much concerned of climate change and uh, and, and the motivation is has clearly grow, has been growing to to mitigate the climate uh, climate change and and uh, president macron of france was hosting one planet summit where they had also uh, private sector actors uh, from big us companies uh, present and big european companies present and uh, and also, private sector is, is is moving in the right direction. We, ha we are it's highly attractive to invest in renewable energy, solar and wind, as, as, a, as an example, and uh, and also the use of electric vehicles and so forth. That's uh, that's that's growing. And, and also, the finance sector has started uh, started moving. They want to invest their 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 resources. Uh, uh, of course, in, in a beneficial manner, but they see that uh, these new solutions are going to be also attractive uh, from financial perspective, and of course, they want to invest their their their, their resources also in a climate smart way. Uh, way. But e even even this financial attraction exists, and uh, 
for example, solar and wind energy today, they're, they're fairly attractive for the, for, for the energy sector. Uh, I can see there are more questions, but I think we have to stop here. Um, so I would like to thank uh, Professor Carlos for the very wonderful presentation and also for answering all the questions. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful Q&A session. Please be seated. It's such a memorable moment to take some good photos. First, may I invite the following guests to come up to the front. Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, Professor Petteri Tullus. Mr. Alex Lloyd, representing Dr. Lucy Wall, founder of the Lucy Wall Prize. Poly U President, Professor Timothy Tong, member of the Board of Governors, Lucy Wall Prize, Dr. Moses Chang Moji and Professor Choi Lap Di, and Chairman of the Prize Recommendation Committee, Professor Lawrence Lau. One, two, three, smile. Please stay at the front. May I invite the following guests to join us for another photo. Assistant Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, Mr. Zhang Wenjian, Poly U Deputy President and Provost, Professor Philip Chen, Mrs. Bettina Liu and Mrs. Mili Liu, Poly U Executive Vice President, Dr. Miranda Liu, Chief Executive Officer, Luizhi War Management Limited, Mrs. Daisy Tong, General Manager, Luizhi War Prize, Ms. Yvonne Lai, Poly U Vice President, Research Development, Professor Alex White, Poly U Vice President, Campus Development and Facilities, Mr. Andy Tong, Poly U Interim Vice President, Student Affairs, Professor Jeffrey Sun. Ready, smile. Thank you, please be seated. Dear guests, dear guests, we want to take a big group photo for with all of you. Please stay on your seat. Would the photographer please come to the front? Would I get